And what could make you conceive what that sudden calamity will be? A day when mankind will be like moths swarming in confusion, and the mountains will be like fluffy tufts of wool. The Quran, chapter 101, verses 3 through 5. Get the Fed chairman on the civets immediately. I don't care what he's doing. The national security advisor barked at his aide, who scrambled on her laptop, trying to ping the Federal Reserve chairman's chief of staff. The secure video teleconference on the room's wall-length monitor had an empty square where the chairman's video feed should be. The White House Situation Room, cramped as always, felt as hospitable as a boiler room. The National Security Advisor wanted answers. The cabinet members had none. He knew he'd have to brief the president shortly. The media outlets had been reporting the breaking news for an hour already that morning. Millions of people's credit card transactions were being declined. Online payments were being rejected in the early workday. And the sign of economic Armageddon appeared. People were lining up in front of banks. In the Situation Room, the department and agency heads of the most powerful nation in the world focused on one thing, covering their backsides. The Treasury Secretary said her intel shop had moved unprecedented resources towards Singapore and the SWIFT system for months. The Secretary of State said his head of diplomatic security had personally reviewed the operational security plan of the Marina Bay Sands Hotel and Casino. The National Security Advisor looked around the short conference table. Sixteen intelligence agencies, and not one can tell me about how dozens of central bankers dropped dead at the SWIFT meetings, and why our banking system is out of order right now. Everyone looked down except the CIA director. He looked over at the head of the FBI, who then glanced behind her shoulder at the room's back bench. The CIA director cleared his throat. <clears> throat. Well, sir, we do have someone on joint duty assignment, one of the Bureau's counterintelligence agents who has been on rotation to the CIA's Office of the General Counsel. Okay, I'm all ears, the National Security Advisor said. The CIA and FBI directors turned around and looked squarely at Ian Dunn. Agent Dunn scooted his chair up to the table of principals. Sir... I'm Ian Dunn with FBI CI. I've been investigating unusual activity which came during one of CIA Office of Security's regular security clearance renewals. Last year, an employee was placed on administrative leave pending a further investigation, and we noticed something else. Bottom line up front, Agent Dunn. I don't have time for the whole case file, the National Security Advisor barked. We believe that a CIA officer has gone rogue and is in cahoots with Nigerian cyber criminals and may be striking back at the U.S. due to, uh, well, we're not sure. Most likely money, ideology, or ego. Yes, I'm familiar with the Nigerian troubles, the National Security Advisor said. So this Nigeria cyber sabotage has morphed to the whole world? Why isn't this rogue CIA person in custody? Well, he's very elusive, sir, Dunn answered. We knew he had traveled to Abuja. He fell off our radar for a time, but has sprung up in Singapore of late. Thing is, while we've gathered a lot of intel, we don't have ironclad evidence right now, and we're trying to piece things together. The network he may be involved in, what family members may be working with him, and that's why this is a joint CIA-FBI operation. It's unclear how much this may be foreign and how much is domestic. The civet screen dinged a bell sound, and the top of the Fed chairman's head appeared in his box on the screen. Hello, 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 am I on mute? The chairman asked. Now where have you been? The national security advisor asked. Sorry, I'm flying to Basel, Switzerland, he said, lowering the camera view to eye level. The Bank for International Settlements is having an emergency meeting. All central bank governors, 
the ones who are still alive, are heading here. Singapore was not considered safe anymore. So what exactly happened last night? The national security advisor asked. We know very little at this point, the Fed chairman said. Just that half the central bank governors of the world are dead. I was one sip away from the same fate myself. They're thinking it was poison in the cocktails, but every bottle and glass of liquid they have tested have come up negative. The autopsies show that their organs just stopped working. And what about the problems this morning? The national security advisor asked. We have reports that the payment system first went haywire in East Asia. Now it's happening in Europe and the United States. Yes, all the Code 51s, the Fed chairman said. The what? Code 51, the error code for insufficient funds in debit and credit card payments, the Fed chairman explained. Most of the major payment settlement systems are not working. These are small-scale vulnerabilities we had seen signs of, but they are expanding. First in the Nigeria payment system, then it was suspected that the international swift messaging systems could be affected. Now it looks like it has jumped into the domestic clearing and settlement infrastructure of dozens of nations. Retail payments are non-functional. The software that is connected to the balance sheets of financial institutions and payment companies for online retail payments is not properly representing the balance sheets of the central bank accounts. Mr. Chairman, can you explain it for us philosophy majors, please? The national security advisor huffed. Well, the digital representation of bank balances has been corrupted, the chairman said. You know how when you use your credit card on the weekend, your bank account online will say pending or processing until sometime on Monday? Yes, said the national security advisor. That's because there are two separate parts of the credit card payment process. First is that initial approval, where there's something called an authorization, basically software that you interact with. The merchant's card machine sends your credit card and transaction information to a card network like Visa or MasterCard, which routes it to the cardholder's issuing bank to see if the cardholder is in good standing and if there are any red flags for suspicious activity. This takes milliseconds to happen, and if everything checks out, your purchase is tentatively approved. But no money moves in that time. The merchant usually groups all the transactions made during the day and then sends that authorization data in one batch to the merchant's acquiring bank, which analyzes it all and routes the batch via the card network to your issuing bank. That's the settlement process. So there's a lot of time between that swipe of a credit card and all the money transferring. So until the merchant, the merchant's acquiring bank, the cardholder's issuing bank, and the card network finish settling everybody's transactions, your online account will say it is pending. So if you use your card on Saturday, the banks are closed most of the weekend, so your payment won't get finalized until sometime Monday, with the multiple layers of software and all the silos of information transfer, if one part of this process goes awry, the transactions cannot go through. So with these transactions, it looks like either the wrong amount is getting transmitted from the card machine at the point of sale through to the bank, or maybe the bank's accounting software is misreading the account balance. Someone could have a million dollars available, but the software thinks the account is empty, and so the merchant gets the code 51 error and can't process the purchase. Have we ever seen anything like this before? The national security advisor asked. No, the Fed chairman responded. Nothing on such a massive scale. It's not just one bank or one payment network, but dozens of them, the biggest ones. We're trying to find a more specific pattern, but it just seems random. The National Security Advisor leaned back, inhaled deeply, and furrowed his brow. Processing. Assessing. He put his hands on his head and puffed out air with exasperation. His silence of several seconds was heavy, broken only after his thoughts settled into a directive. Okay, we have three things to do, he said. He peered at the Fed chairman on the civet screen. Number one, we need to stop the bleeding. 
Otherwise, this could bring down our whole economy like a ton of bricks. Look, Chairman, I know you're not under the executive branch and you don't take orders from the office of president, but this is a generational emergency. I need you and your team to come up with a way to stop the run on the banks while finding a way to resume transactions again. We can't shift to physical cash because people would empty their bank accounts, but we do need a medium of exchange so the economy can start moving. Figure it out and get the rest of the world on board. The National Security Advisor then turned toward the heads of Treasury, the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA. Second, I need you all to join forces and figure out the technical cause of this cyber sabotage, how it is working, and who is behind it. As far as I'm concerned, this is an act of war. He looked intensely at the Secretary of Defense, also across the table, without elaborating further. The Secretary of Defense looked back and nodded slightly. The National Security Advisor turned back to the others. Report back when you've got more than speculation. And Mr. Dunn, I don't care how elusive this guy is, we need him in custody. There will be no executive authority which will not be at our disposal to accomplish that. Every agency will cooperate with you. Bring him in. Yes, sir, Agent Dunn said, acknowledging the gravity of a directive given in the White House in front of all the government's national security principles. We have a good lead, Dunn continued. We believe that he was at the Marina Bay Sands Hotel at the time of the central banker's dinner. Singapore is small and the liaison is cooperating with us. We have a team on it. We'll get it done by extradition or extraction. The Situation Room stayed tense, exuding the acknowledgement of the beginning of a new war. It was midday, and I only slept a third of the previous night. The rest of it I spent watching the news about the payment collapse, pondering how to stop it. Zaki drove me back toward the vicinity of the Marina Bay Sands, I needed to put together more pieces of the puzzle that unfolded in that casino. I knew I wouldn't be able to go inside with all the security, but I was prepared to stake out. Looking out the car window as we drove, I saw streets that were emptier than normal. In front of stores were makeshift signs reading, Cash Only, or Closed, colon, Code 51. Taxis were only taking cash. Cards and mobile payments were now worthless in Singapore. But Zaki and his Uncle Asim had given me some walking around money before I left their house. My status as a traveler in their midst conferred a special blessing into their spending on me, and thus a valuable spiritual reward, Odger. Zaki stopped at the opposite side of the hotel, in front of a place called Haja's Cafe, a handwritten cash-only paper stuck to the storefront's door. I entered and sat at a corner table next to the bay window, the Marina Bay Sands was in clear view from my seat, giving me access to all the whirlwind of activity around the aftermath of an international crime scene. Police inspectors, private security, even bomb-sniffing dogs, and a bunch of media reporters scouring the grounds for different story leads and unique angles. I ordered a black coffee for a couple Singaporean dollars and settled into a corner table with a notepad. I observed the scene beyond the window in the way I studied my three monitors back in the Kurmi compound in Keno, watching, scanning, observing the details of people and movements, determining what was normal so I could isolate the abnormal. Investigators, assessors, and administrators flowed in and out of the hotel, a crowded kaleidoscope of worker bees bumping and buzzing around this ground zero. But then, a couple of figures stood out to me. Two dark-suited men walking with a familiar stiffness, both blond men in their mid-thirties with square jaws and sunglasses. They moved pointedly, standing out like U.S. government officials often do while parachuting into the other side of the world. They were talking to a uniformed Singaporean official who looked mid-level in the scheme of things, like a police chief, clearly a man of authority on the scene but low on the totem pole for an international crisis of this scale. He was briefing the two men in black, who nodded as he pointed up, toward the casino tower at the top of the hotel. He was educating them about something. They seemed to be taking mental notes, as if they were not just interviewing the chief but evaluating him. They were intense, but aloof. 
If I were a betting man, I would have wagered these guys had spent formative years in Provo, Utah. I had met many CIA officers and FBI agents that were graduates of Brigham Young University. Not surprising. A graduating Mormon who never drank, never smoked, and kept away from caffeine, let alone hard drugs? You could expedite that security clearance, as long as background investigators could take account of that two-year mission to the Philippines. My eyes studied these two and the Singaporean police chief who motioned toward an assistant yards away. The assistant came up to them with a tray of hot drinks and white cups. The chief grabbed two to give to the men, who declined the offering. I perked up in my seat. These guys were U.S. intel, no doubt. I slid further back in my chair and lifted up the cafe menu to my face. I knew they wouldn't notice me perched in a window across the street, but I felt surveilled nonetheless. My intelligence instincts had drawn me to revisit the Marina Bay Sands. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I believed the scenery would help me think. I needed to place myself in the scene, just like I placed myself in the midst of the Central Bank of Nigeria transaction records, picking out the patterns and anomalies. I was fixated not just on the monetary crisis and not just the mass murder of central bankers, but the past year plus of uncanny intelligence community activity that included my CIA suspension. There was some chess match being played, but it felt bigger than Georgia Coy, Nassim Oyo, and Harold Smith. And these two out-of-place men in black suits in Singapore could be considered dispatched knights, but they were probably pawns. I got lost in this absorption of the scene for a good minute until the weight shifted on my table. It inclined slightly underneath a delicate hand palmed down. I followed its arm up to see the attractive Miss Jasmine Lau smiling. You again, she said, holding a cup of coffee with an elegant red leather purse around her arm. She was dressed colorfully, but professionally. Her earrings sparkled, and I felt nervous. Oh, what are the chances? I asked rhetorically. Quite the crazy night, no? Mind if I sit down for a minute? She asked. Go right ahead, I said, welcoming her to sit even though my instincts told me she brought nothing but complications. She sat down and leaned so close I could make out her perfume's sweetness, faint as it was. Look, I know you're not a security consultant, at least not a building security consultant she said. This is the third time we've bumped into each other, and you still haven't told me your name. She fluttered her eyelashes at me softly. I get it. You don't want me to know who you are. The only time men don't want me to know who they are, they give me a fake name. You wouldn't even do that. I thought about what she said as she was saying it. She was young but astute. Ms. Lau, I've had a rough night, I told her. This situation has me exhausted. I'm just trying to take it all in. I don't mean to be rude, but... Then don't be, she cut in, then whispered. Just listen. I know you're an intelligence officer. Intelligence people stick out like sore thumbs, especially American ones. She looked at me, waiting for a reaction, which I did not give. I listened. I know you will not confirm it, just as I will not confirm anything about my consulting work in Hong Kong. This was interesting. She spoke words that gave me a wink and a nod, conveying the familiar vibe of the world of espionage, speaking in generalities and allusions that only an intelligence officer would dissect properly. What was unsaid was more important than what she uttered. But I do know one thing, Jasmine continued. You're running or hiding from something. You're not with those guys. She pointed across the street to the two men in black I had been eyeing. She was eyeing them too, it seemed. They might be the lead team, but you're not with them. You seem to be hiding from them. So that tells me one thing. You don't trust your own government. You don't trust your own colleagues. Why? Have you experienced something that made you lose your trust? Do you not know who to trust? 
She paused purposefully. This was not rhetorical. Look, uh, Ms. Lau, I stuttered, struggling to deflect her psychoanalysis, trying to not think too much about what she was asking. She was lasering in on my inner workings, something only Sophia and my CIA polygrapher had ever done. I know this is hard, she continued, softening her voice, leaning even closer and focusing her eye contact as she touched my shoulder. Her breath smelled naturally sweet. I understand you. Those three words surprised me, landing at my center, weak from a year of turmoil and loneliness. It stuck at my center. She continued, If you are as perceptive as you seem to be, I'm sure you have been trying to figure out how, how certain things could be happening around you without your government's knowledge. You probably know that something is wrong. It probably started long before you got to Singapore. You know something's, what is it, something's not kosher? She paused again. Go on, I said. Have you ever considered if maybe, just maybe you are being used? She continued. That maybe your own agency was abusing your talents and maybe it was not on the right side. With all due respect, if you're trying to feed me the line of America as the big Satan, you're barking up the wrong tree. I'm a patriot. Full stop. Oh, no, 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 she said, recoiling. No one is saying the United States is big bad evil or anything, but sometimes the powerful countries get too drunk on their power. Sometimes they need a Boston Tea Party to shake them up. And sometimes the patriot needs... Help from another country. Did not France aid the Founding Fathers? Ma'am, last I checked on it, treason was a capital offense. But what if... Jasmine responded. What if the only way to save your country was to do it from the outside? Because those you are working for, who you have given your career and life are, frauds. Frauds? I asked. There was something about that word that pinged my memory banks. Yes, they may be frauds, fraudsters, she said. The repetition of that word made me stop to think. She could tell I was mulling something over. I know this is a lot. You do not need to answer me right here, right now. But why don't we talk later in my hotel room? I have two key cards. Now they are only allowing people into the hotel if you have a guest room card. You could use the hotel side garden entrance. It's overlooked less security. She placed one hotel key card on the small table. Then she took out a business card and a pen. Here is my room number, she said, scribbling a few digits on the back of the card. How about this? I know you've had a rough night. I understand. You come to the room tonight, and we talk about how maybe I can help. And if I can't help you with the state of the world and of this crisis, maybe, just maybe, I can help you in some other ways. And by the morning, you can let me know if you're feeling better. She smiled subtly with her mouth, but brightly with her eyes. She spoke in a language that few men could not translate. She let her finger linger on the business card for a few seconds and pointed to the hotel card. She put her pen back into her purse, closed it, got up, and walked towards the door. When she reached the exit, she turned back to me, tilted her head, and blinked slowly. I tried the hardest to ignore her beauty, but my gaze locked on to her like she was a hypnotist. Then she turned back and walked out. I sat motionless. I tried not to touch the cards on the table. I kept my arms at my side and stared down, eyeing the Marina Bay Sands Hotel logo on the key card and looking at her business card, which had her name underneath, HK Financial Advisors Limited, along with a Hong Kong address and phone number. I stared so much the writing started blurring. My mind wandered thinking how both cards were actually keys. Two keys to open a door that I was curious about. 
a door for answers, but a door that seemed to be laced with a dangerous price. Later in Basel, Switzerland. Can you stream the international news broadcast before we arrive? The U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman asked his assistant as they rode in the back of the sleek black car steered by the U.S. consulate driver. I need to know what's happened since we got off the plane. Yes, let me pull something up, the assistant replied as she pulled out her tablet. She swiped and clicked on a live news app. They looked intently. A news anchor appeared on screen, speaking over flashing scenes of crowds. Turmoil unfolds in dozens of cities around the globe this afternoon as shops, unable to accept card payments due to what is being dubbed the Code 51 crisis, have closed their doors, with commerce grinding to a complete stop. Throughout Europe, Asia, the Americas, and Africa, we are seeing the same events play out. Masses of people breaking into grocery markets, pandemonium unleashed as the young and old alike loot food, water, and toilet paper. And as most financial institutions have suspended withdrawals, crowds outside of banks increasingly are turning violent. Customers are demanding access to their cash and safety deposit boxes, attacking jewelry stores as the price of gold skyrockets. Most nations have declared states of emergency as political leaders and financial authorities scramble to try to calm the public amidst the chaos. In this hour, we speak to a leading economist who says that the world is on the brink of devolving into financial dark ages and that bartering of personal possessions may soon become the only way to conduct business. That's enough, the Fed chairman said. It's up to us. The world will be looking for U.S. leadership. We can't let this go on. The assistant swiped off the app. The car arrived at the towering headquarters of the Bank for International Settlements. The two Fed officials ran in, determined that they would not leave that building until they had a plan that the rest of the world would sign off on. The assistant's tablet held notes from their flight-long brainstorming session, outlining a half-dozen back-of-the-envelope ideas to stop the global monetary hemorrhaging. The Fed chairman kept the ideas in hard copy on his physical notepad. They knew that in this unprecedented crisis, no one plan would be perfect for every nation. But by working through the pros and cons of each option, they hoped to find international consensus. And as the world's leading financial power, they knew the U.S. must take on the burden of lifting the world out of the crisis. There was no meeting in their lives more important than the one they were about to enter. They needed to demonstrate confidence and leadership from the start of the meeting. The Fed chairman and his assistant approached the door to the main BIS conference hall. They looked at each other and nodded with firm resolve, ready to get things done. They pushed open the door, revealing a packed room with central bank delegates around a huge semicircle conference table. Only two seats were empty behind a placard that read, the United States of America. They quickly sat down and the assistant laid out her tablet in front of them with the screen open to option one. One of the delegates was finishing up some comments, speaking into the microphone. His placard read, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. And yes, we believe this calls for drastic measures. Hong Kong seconds the motion for a vote. A woman spoke into her microphone. Her placard read, Federal Republic of Nigeria. It was Central Bank Governor, Dr. Chikere. All who agree with the proposal, please raise your hand. About 50 hands raised. Dr. Chikere counted them. The U.S. Fed chairman was bewildered. Wait, what, what motion? What vote is this? He asked. All who vote nay on the proposal, please raise your hand, Chikere said, ignoring the Fed chairman. About a dozen hands raised as the Nigerian woman counted. Excuse me, madam, I demand an explanation as to what this vote entails, the Fed chairman said, standing up. 
Why are we voting on a matter without the consultation of the United States? Mr. Chairman, it is not our fault that you are late to this meeting, Dr. Chikere said. This is not the IMF or the World Bank where the United States has outsized influence. This is BIS, the coordinating body for all central banks. Our decisions are made according to one central bank, one vote. The rest of the world has shown up promptly in this crisis. Did you not get the email that the emergency meeting was moved up by an hour? What email? The Fed chairman asked, perplexed, and looked at his assistant for answers. She looked down at her tablet, the inbox which had no new messages. We received no email about a time change, the Fed chairman said. Dr. Chikere's only response was sucking her teeth. She turned aside and spoke to the rest of the room. The votes have been counted, she said. The membership has voted overwhelmingly in support of the multilateral proposal to build payment infrastructure around a new synthetic international digital currency known as Reserve Zenith Quantity, or the RZQ. The BIS Technological Innovation Committee will go to work immediately to introduce this asset into global markets, sharing the lessons learned from the data analysis of the pilot program in Nigeria. This meeting is adjourned. She stamped the table with a gavel. The other delegates bolted from the semicircle, grabbing their phones, texting, calling, and rushing out the door. The Fed chairman and his assistant sat still, stunned. Wait, what, what just happened here? The Fed chairman asked. Well, sir, it looks like the world just elected a new global reserve currency separate from the U.S. dollar. The assistant responded. A new currency that we know nothing about. The Fed chairman added. Let's get to a secure area and get on the civets to the White House. Yes, sir, said the assistant, gathering up her tablet and belongings. They both stood up. Then a ding pinged the assistant's phone. She looked at an alert that popped up. It was from the Wall Street Journal. She held up the phone so they both could read it. Breaking news. The world's central banks to introduce new international digital currency to overcome the Code 51 crisis. Before we do the civets, contact the intel folks, the Fed chairman ordered. Find out what they can tell us about this RZQ stuff and why didn't anyone know it was coming. I'm on it, sir, the assistant responded, rushing ahead and out the door. The chairman dropped back down in his chair, launching a thud echoing around the grand, now empty conference hall. After the echo, the silence fell thick. He looked at his paper notebook and opened it up to the middle, where he had taken notes on the plane. The top of one page read, Option 1. The U.S. will provide influx of dollar reserves to central banks at no interest. Invest in payment network rebuild. He gazed at his handwritten notes. And then he took his pen and steadily drew a huge, wide X across the page. He closed the book, crossed his arms, and slumped down in defeat. I don't know, is this transmitting? We are going to have to stop this transmission. I'll have to splice a few things together. Um, it appears there may be an interception, um, at least being attempted. We're going to have to pause right now We'll return with the next transmission. We'll upload it uh, in seven days. We, we have only a few more files to transmit, uh, but this channel, this area is not secure. We're going to have to sign off. We've got to get off the rooftops now. Get off the rooftop now.